get started. Um, uh, welcome to the Fredonia Technology Incubator. Um, my name is Chuck Cornell. I'm the director here at the Incubator. Um, I believe this is our 15th um, installment of what's uh, called the Arts and Business Luncheon Series. Um, this started a number of years ago uh, with one of our faculty members um, who made a suggestion that we um, have some of our visiting artists that come to our visiting artist program come to the incubator and talk about the business uh, side of the arts. Um, and that was Alberto Ray, who's uh, one of our faculty members. Since then, we've been um, getting folks from the visiting artist program um, and some other uh, uh, people, including um, Alberto himself, to come and talk about not their art or how they do their art, but how do they make money. Um, what, what, what do they need to do in order to have a business um, so they can eat and uh, support themselves as opposed to talking about that, that um, how they do their art. So that's why we have, have this series and it's been great, it's been well attended. I'm glad all of you are here today. Um, I want to thank my uh, staff, Lori Gronsky who's in the back, um, uh, and uh, Monica Kemp who's our program manager. Um, so they're the ones that make these events happen, um, and I appreciate uh, that. Um, it's great to see Moj here too, our dean of our School of Business as well. Um, so without further ado, I want to um, introduce um, our speaker today, um, who a couple years ago, I probably wouldn't have known you if I walked past you, but uh, Armand Petrie um, is, somebody, is somebody that's been um, here at the Incubator um, providing a lot of uh, sound advice and um, has helped us with a, a project that we call the studio, um, where we have really involved music industry um, and uh, our students and our faculty and some of our clients here who are business startups um, get involved in things like video game um, development, um, sound recording, video recording, uh, things of that nature. It's been a, a tremendous asset that we're still in the middle of, of building. So we appreciate you being here today. Um, Armand Petrie um, has expertise in recording and production, live sound, marketing and promotions, and artist management. He has 40 years now in the industry, including work with diverse artists such as the Goo Goo Dolls, the 10,000 Maniacs, and Sixpence None Richer. Um, holding an MA in Arts Management from the University of Buffalo, Armand has revamped the music industry program at SUNY Fredonia, working as a professor and as the program coordinator to present students with professional speakers, world-class musicians, and internship resources. Um, it's important to mention a lot of these folks out here helping today are students. Some of our attendees are students, um, and uh, it's great to see the students here. We do have a student business competition um, every year. Um, and uh, uh, again, this year, is there, a, is there a time I'm supposed to announce or anything like that? Or just to, so sure. there is information on the back. So any students here that are interested in pitching a, a business idea, um, we will be having a pitch performance uh, workshop in March, um, specifically on March 6th. Um, and then we'll also have a business model canvas workshop. So students that are interested in, in pitching for the student business competition, um, please take one of those flyers and come to our workshop. It's open to everybody, by the way. Um, and uh, we'll get that going. So without further ado, uh, I'm happy to Thanks for being here. There's never a free lunch. <laughs> you have to listen to me for a half hour. What can I tell you? Um, for those of you, I mean, they went over things, uh, Trump went over some things briefly. I've had 40 years in, in the uh, music industry as a road musician, sound man, record producer, songwriter, and um, now education. And most of the students who come into the program, and most of their parents, still have the concept of you get your artist, you get something together, and somebody will sign you and take care of you. A record company, something like that. It doesn't happen anymore. It's gone. That business model is dead. 
record companies are not interested. They haven't been interested in, develop, in developing artists since the late 70s when, and I'm sure a lot of you out there will remember, Saturday Night Fever, Frampton Comes Alive, and uh, Boston, these records sold 15 million copies. And the record company said, why do we have to develop anybody? What? Why? So they stopped doing that. And then they basically rode the wave of, well, this band was successful. We're going to sign somebody else like them and hopefully we'll have success. So the major labels right now are making their money off catalog sales. Uh, a SUNY Fredonia graduate, Jeff, uh, Jeff James, uh, he's put out, I think, three major releases of box sets of old artists. Jimi Hendrix, Blue Blues, things like that. So how does somebody today make a living in the music industry? 40 years, and my home base was Silver Creek. Never left Silver Creek. And it's still there doing film scores. So how do you do it? How do you get how do you get people interested in you? How do you get people to get involved with what you're doing? Uh, it still comes down to the main thing of you have to have as an artist somebody that's interested in listening to what you're doing. If there's no if no one wants to hear what you're doing, you're stuck. Uh, you need to have an image. Some type of an image that's going to draw people to something that you're particularly doing. And lots of hard work. It never ends. The music industry is 24 7, it's eight days a week. You can't give up, you can't lay back, you can't wait for somebody to come to you, as I tell my students. It's not being in the right place at the right time, it's putting yourself in the right place at the right time. So it's a never ending thing of work. You always have to work. What are you going to have that somebody wants to listen to? Okay, late 1980s, a band from Buffalo that nobody knew how to categorize. They finally got signed to a little label called Death Records, which was a subsidiary of a label called Metal Blade Records, which was a, a subsidiary of a, band called, of a label called Enigma distributed by Capital. So you're like way down on the list there. The band was the Goo Dolls. Nobody knew how to categorize this band. But somebody wanted to listen to them. Same with our own 10,000 Maniacs. They got signed in the midst of skinny ties and bands with bad hair that had British accents and metal. So also you've got this, you know, this hippie band coming out of Jamestown, New York, but somebody wanted to listen to them and they worked really hard. And then the band I met is Six Pence and the Richer. God forbid, a Christian band. Oh my goodness, who wants to hear a Christian band? But two million people want to. So it's basically finding out what you have and putting it in the niche and the market. Every band is unique. Now I come back to how do you do it? How do you do it in an area like Dunkirk, Fredonia, Jamestown, or whatever? Now, what I teach my students now is you get involved with your community any way that you possibly can. At uh, the Fredonia Marketing and Student Record Label, Hale Fredonia Records, we put on charity events. There's no better way to get people on your side than to give something back to the community. Everybody is there. And what you need to do is to take any little piece of what you've got and do it. And here's some examples of what we've done. I'm sure people are familiar with Denny Lane from the Wings and Moody Blues. I just happened to meet Denny by accident. <laughs> and we had we had a, we started up a good relationship. He told me about his musical that he wrote, Arctic Song. Gave me the tapes. Very interesting. Wonderful little, wonderful piece of music, and um, so I decided to produce this musical. Got the Fredonia campus involved with the musicians, and we put on a concert with an orchestra, a choir, and then 
the first premier in the United States of this of this work, Arctic Song. We worked within the area to get this taken care of. The next was the British invasion. A local promoter in Hamburg, who I got to know, uh, was bringing these guys in. It was actually kind of kind of a mess. <laughs> uh, he was originally supposed to bring some. He was supposed to bring in um, someone else. They got canceled out, so they actually he ended up bringing in Joey Mahler from Badfinger. I met Joey twenty some years ago. Kept up a good relationship, and this is the first time I met Terry Sylvester from Polly's. So he was bringing this band in, and I wanted to get them to Fredonia to do to talk to the students. So what we ended up doing is we partnered to bring it in. I put up some money. He put up some money. We brought them in. We advertised this concert, and we worked within the community. He got quite a nice turnout because he got a lot of people from this area to come to Hamburg who would never have known about the concert. Artie Kornfeld from Woodstock. Artie was coming up. Uh, he was being brought up by the town ballroom for a benefit show. So we helped bring Artie in, brought Artie to Fredonia. And Artie, Artie uh, I mean, he was one of the people that put on Woodstock, but his history also encompassed, he was an A&R, he was a major songwriter. Uh, the youngest uh, A&R person for Capitol Records, he signed a band that Debbie Harry was in called Wind in the Willows. So Artie had quite a history. Once again, working with GIF, uh, wearing GFT Communications, getting, working within our area to bring these people in. By the way, all of these uh, posters that you're seeing here were all done by the students in the program. For me, our music industry the students in our music industry program in the student record label marketing, everything is applied learning. It is all hands-on. They do everything. They get yelled at a lot <laughs> when they don't do things like they're supposed to. But they do everything. So another thing here is we put together a um, our own little group called Ladies First for Hilton Records. And there is a Fredonia graduate that works for an organization called Why Hunger in New York City. They basically a grassroots organization that basically, they don't like give food to people. They actually go in and they teach people in their areas about growing food and all this other kind of things. So wonderful things. Paul McCarthy's involved with it. Peter Max. Uh, it's very, very big. Uh, uh, so, one of the other things that we decided to do with the student record label, since I knew Joey, what we have here is a graduate of Fredonia, Savannah King, Joey Mullen from Badfinger, and Mary Ramsey from 10,000 ADX, a Fredonia graduate. And what we decided to do was to um, produce a song for download where all of the proceeds would go to Why Hunger. And we brought them together. We did Sweet Tuesday Morning, which was a Bad Finger song featuring Joey Mond. We were, the students released it. Uh, they got, you know, I'm not going to go over about publishing and all that. You can read about that online. But they found the, the, who owned the publishing. They, got a, they even got a reduced rate. And we, we released it, and a lot of money went to White Hunger. Another charity. So. These are things that we did right out of Fredonia. You don't have to go far and wide. You basically take what is within your area, your friends, the people that you know, you work within the area for charity events, and you get people on board. All of a sudden, you get politicians that love to have their pictures taken with celebrities and to say what wonderful things they're doing. And you get everybody on board to start working. And all of a sudden, what you have and what I tell the students is, okay, you've done this. Now, if you're promoting an artist, put that artist in the forefront of what you're doing. Make sure your artist has something that somebody wants to listen to and that you have an image. Believe me. Anybody familiar with Psy 
Gangnam Style, the Korean rapper. I think he's up to three and a half billion hits now. People wanted to see it. Oh, oh, three and a half billion people. What is that, 10 times the population of the United States? Wanted to see this South Korean rapper. Has anyone who doesn't know about Psy? You should check it out. It's brilliant. <laughs> so it's to the point of with the way social media is, with the way um, communities work together, you can do it within a small community. Now, how are you going to get noticed? Because everybody's doing it now. What do you do? How do you bring this all together? Well, you need. Um, once again, as I teach students at Fredonia, you need a team of people. Nobody can do anything on their own. It just doesn't happen that way. So if your strength is uh, you recognize what, what great talent is and you bring them in, you will need a producer. You will need a video person to get them. You will need a marketer. You will need somebody that knows the internet and knows how to get things out of them because your competition is so, so great. But every artist is, is unique as their music or as anything. So there's, is there a master plan for this? Definitely not. There is no master plan. You've got to feel it and do it as you go along. I managed to band six minutes on the richer. They were high school students. How am I going to get this band out there? How am I going to get people to notice that? How are we going to sell the records? So that's the thing that you're always presented with. Within an area, within working with charities and working with your community, it always works out really well. And I am going to show you one of our most interesting productions that we did with our student record label, Hail for Knowing Your Records. This was from April 2016. Here's how something like this can happen. I had a graduate from the program who was just kind of working in New York. And she said, and she knew that I had a, a son with autism. And I, we worked within the uh, Institute for Autism Research in Buffalo at Fisher's College. And uh, their max out program is amazing. Absolutely amazing. It turned my son from a shy little guy into an extrovert that we actually now have to tell him, will you stop talking? <laughs> uh, so she sent me, there was an artist down there, Cassandra Kavitsky, who wrote a song for a local school called Not So Different. She sent me the link. The lyrics were amazing. I mean, just beautiful lyrics. I didn't like the way it was produced. So I contacted Cassandra and said, I'd like to do the song, and I want to redo it, and I'd like to do it with Mary Ramsey from 10,000 Millions. Cassandra said, yes, let's do it, let's do it. I said, I, I, I will do it, and I want the proceeds from the download to go to Institute for Autism Research. She said, great. So while I was pulling this together, I was using some people from the area for um, arranging. Uh, I was getting all my musician friends to come in and perform on it. I went to Rodney Taycock. He said, I'll give you the studio time to do it working with, with all your community. And as I was texting John Bresson from the Google Dolls, I said, hey, why should you listen to the song? And he heard it and he says, wow, it's a really great song. He says, great, you want to sing on it? And he goes, yeah, I'll sing on it. Okay, so we're putting it together. I've got myself a great, great um, team of people to put the song together for a download. And then I thought, are anybody not familiar with Record Store Day? Record Store Day is uh, an event that happens uh, where <coughs> independent record stores get two days out of the year to get special releases and people line up for hours <coughs> to, for, the, for the, yes, Monty's laughing, to, to get these special releases. So I called John and I said, how about if we do a special pressing and release for Record Store Day? 
they went, great, yeah, I'll come up for that. Why don't we do a show? I'm like, you want to do a Goo Goo Dolls show? This was, I only had two months to do this. I called them in February. Record store day was in April. I said, okay. So once again, called a buddy of mine at uh, Buff State. Want a Goo Goo Dolls show? Yeah. I said, all the money is going to charity. He goes, fine. That's fantastic. We'll do it. So, by the way, this was all done by Fredoni Studios. <clears throat> this was our calendar of events for the student record label. We were doing a songwriters night with Benny Lane, John Lamar, and Mary Ramsey. April 10th, uh, we had an on-campus event at the Williams Center uh, for people in the area with children with autism. We had all kinds of fun things going on. April 15th, we scheduled the digital download release of Not So Different. And April 16th, Record Store Day, Artists for Autism, sold out. We sold out the concert in an hour. <clears throat> the first things to go were the $150 beat rates. We had 30 of them. They went within minutes. Students did, uh, this was for the songwriters night, students did posters. Uh, once again, this was a gift from the music industry program. Uh, they did, uh, uh, we did get some support from the community. The students designed the posters, and we had hundreds of people show up for raffles and donations and um, all kinds of silent auctions and things like that. This was for the on-campus event at the <coughs> Williams Center. And there was our release, not so different. We had a special pressing of 500 copies. We made it available on iTunes and Google Play. Once again, all the students are doing this. Our April 16th record store day, about 300 people showed up to pay $20 for the special CD release only, and Cassandra, Mary, and Robbie and Johnny from Google Dolls were there to autograph it. And there is the poster for the sold out event. In the final analysis, at, at the end of the event, we had raised over $30,000 for the Institute for Autism Research. And everything was done from Fredonia. Now, if I had a band, now if I was in a different position where I was a professor, but I wanted something to do with, um, if I had an artist that was managing, I would have put the artist on as the opening band. I would have had marketing for the artist, all this kind of thing. And uh, how long have I been band with her? About a half hour. And I saw a hand go up. Yes. Um, your 30000 was that uh, net, or was that gross? That uh, that was gross. That was yeah, but that, but that had deep well, expenses. That, that, yeah, well, no, we presented a check to the Institute for Autism Research and that night. That was twenty five thousand dollars clear. And then there was an additional five thousand dollars in raffles and online downloads. And so then, uh, is that indicating that all the uh, help, assistance, and provisions from Fredonia State was grabbed? Yep. It was. it was. My students did this. They did everything. They ran the show. Okay. They learned. They learned. Oh, well, what did they learn? <laughs> they learned. And what they learned is, wow, you could do an event from a small town. As long as you are there helping people and using your community to benefit the community. Yes. How did the artists benefit? What their compensation? Um, which 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 particular? Yeah, all of all of the above. Cassandra. Uh, basically, you've probably heard Cassandra, but you don't know it. She was like a huge voiceover artist. But all she wanted to do was to help the kids, and she got to open for the, she got to play a concert with the Goo Goo Dolls, which definitely helped her career. Mary is just a sweetheart, and just did it because she would want to do it. And the Goo Goo Dolls, 
they are totally community conscious, particularly in Buffalo. They're flying up from New York just to play the telephone. But they've got to pay their expenses. No. The Blue they House pay for everything they own. They paid it out of their own pockets. They brought in their road crew, their manager, everybody. Pay for it out of their pockets because they're their host. But why did they do this? Just because it was Buffalo. If it had been something in Pittsburgh or San Francisco, they probably would have done. But they're always there for Buffalo. Always. This is the, this is where those guys' hearts are. And Robbie still lives here. Johnny wants to be back. Yes. Hey, um, going back to what you were saying about marketing, you know, like looking for the niches in your area. Um, I work in a specific genre, and I've been doing it for 13 years, and I know the niches for the genre that I work in, like a traditional country western. Mm -hmm. But um, my issue is I have issues getting to these uh, to the to the places where these niches are because I have transportation impairments. Okay. Um, so it's essentially you're not going to go out. And then play and, and, and that kind of thing. You like I know them. where they are, and I would be proud to go to them if I uh, could do so. But I can't for trans for the tram because of my transportation. Are you a solo artist? Uh, yeah. I can do so. I can go either way. I okay. mainly do solo at this point because it's hard to find people that are into traditional country western from my experience in this area. But I have worked with a band in the past, and I could. But trying to find a good steel guitar or fiddle in this area is like pulling teeth. Well, there's a few in Buffalo. They're kind of nuts, but they're, they're good mm -hmm. guys. And once again, I <laughs> find a way to get up there. Yeah, what guys like reverb? I need reverb in my headphones. I, so I finally took a signal out, just left nothing but reverb in there. It's like that's perfect. <laughs> um, so I, I don't want to pry. Uh, your transportation is it you don't have transportation, or is it because of a physical disability? Okay, so it's because of a disability. Okay. Um, I'm, and you're from where? Uh, Dunkirk. Dunkirk, okay. Uh, I would say, once again, within the realm of the partnership, mm -hmm. and I know it's, it's an interesting area you know, to, to find people, but mm -hmm. if, I'd say your first thing that you probably need to do is to get somebody that's going to believe in what you're doing I as see. much as you do. I they can give you the transportation because I know mm -hmm. Gary has a lot of stuff going on down there, country western wise, mm -hmm. and I know that uh, 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 the Sportsman's Tavern. Yep. Uh, I hate getting that. Mm -hmm. Dwayne. Okay, Dwayne yeah. Hall. Dwayne Hall. Yes. Dwayne is totally into mm -hmm. the community. I've been and up he there has open mics before, and I've played there before, but my only issue is, once again, just currently trying to get up there for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to get somebody that can get the transportation. Yeah, I know, I okay, so there you go. But if, if you can do it, it's great, because there are a lot of it, particularly in Country Western. I mean, there are a lot of people do stick with the communities. I'll give you another example. A student, uh, he was a base student. Um, uh, Ed Croft. Ed Croft. He's played with that. I used to work with him, yep. Ed's wonderful. But Ed, Ed went to Pittsburgh and he was doing stuff down there. And so, and I, I said, Ed, I just want you back up to Buffalo. So I got the job of people there. Ed has infiltrated the music community in Buffalo like no yep. one I have ever seen. Yep. All genres, everything. Jazz, he plays at the Colored Musicians Club, he plays at the Jewish Community Center. He played everywhere. He just goes and inserts himself mm -hmm. into it. And the specific genre that, well, the specific area that I'm into, he's also very much into as well. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Hank Williams Sr. Oh, of course. Yes, that's the main thing that I do. He's done, Adam has done many gigs. And the last gig that Jack did was with the Fredonia student. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you get your transportation. I see. You have the hunger for it. Mm -hmm. And once again, get, get in touch with that. I see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and go up and do some gigs with that. Yeah, you'll do some work with Mike. Uh, one of our professors, Stuart Shapiro, is probably mm -hmm. the best open mic in Buffalo. Yeah. Clarence. Mm -hmm. And just you can serve yourself in the community. I'm sure if nothing else, you'd be willing to do the open mics with me. Yeah. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah. To have, do the open mic with Stuart and have that come down. All right. <laughs> Any other questions from, from anybody? Yes. Well, uh, goodwill, charity, and community service are all wonderful endeavors, 
um, but then uh, a new person, a new group, whatever, um, has to eat too. So how do you make the transition from good name recognition and good you know, identity in the community to moving into uh, being able to pay for your house and enough to eat? Well, once again, um, I said every every um, situation is different. I'll just try and insert making that transition. It's a big step. Uh, Asking yes. for pay for what you're doing. And once again, let me tell you. Um, I will tell you uh, the thing about uh, we'll say the Google Docs. Okay. Those guys were broke. While we were in New York, getting ready to do our third record, they were still broke. The van got robbed. They lost everything. No money whatsoever. None. Now this is a little different thing than the, the charity, but they had people that pitched in to help them. They went on the road, they worked, they applied themselves, and they eventually started making money. I had to give them each a hundred dollars to record the first record, to, to record their record because they were just so broke. If I were to do it today, um, let's say I had um, you know an artist like added or whatever. You basically, with the charity thing, goodwill and blah, 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 you need to look at something, a charity that you're really involved with at IAR, like ours was Institute for Autism Research. So what I would have done if I was just local, without any of my background, without knowing the or anything like that, I would, I would go to a club owner, say, Artie Quitschoff or Dwayne, and say, hey, Let's get our musicians together, and I have my band. Let's do this charity event to help raise money for Institute for Autism Research. Then I would have my merchandise, my all my stuff on the on the table for people to buy. I would videotape it. I would send it out to all types of autism thing, autism people. Put my stuff online, and eventually the money starts coming coming in. I'll give you another example. Three years ago, I asked my students at the student record label, why don't you guys come up with an event? I'm tired of coming up with the events. Why don't you guys come up with something? And they did. They said, we want to do a dog walk. To which I kind of went, OK. <laughs> Let's go with it. Let's see what you do. Unfortunately, it was the best class I ever had. They organized the whole thing. It took us three months to organize it. We got we got donations from everybody, blah, 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 blah. It was for Institute for Autism Research, IAR. We raised $3,500 for them. And we had all kinds of musicians playing. And anybody that was there could sell their stuff. They could videotape it. They could get it out online. Last year, we did Star Paws. Now, you've got to realize, people love dogs. People love Star Wars. You combine the two, and you get a lot of people interested. But the one thing I asked the students was, you better get your social media together. Get your social media together. And they did. We had our dog walk. We contacted. Uh, some Star Wars people from Buffalo that came to do charity events. Uh, people donated food, people gave us baskets. And the students, because of the Star Wars and all that, we got 1.6 million followers. Now, unfortunately, they didn't have their credit card stuff together because people were trying to donate and code. Uh, but we had 1.6 million followers, including Mark Hamill. The social media aspect. This year, we're doing Canine Adventures. We're getting ready with Marvel characters. And I told the students, I want 10 million followers. I want the credit card stuff together. I want everything taken care of. So our goal this year is $10,000 for IAR. We're using so a dog walk. Think about it. I was like, a dog walk? That's going to raise money. But it was a whole community to put things together. And if you were promoting somebody, you do that annual dog walk, people
people are going to notice an artist. They will know. If I was managing, you know, six pence on the richer at that point, once again, I was promoting <coughs> in a different era when it was still record labels and all that kind of thing. But if I was managing them, I would make them the center of all the stuff. I'd have them write a song about canine adventures. I would market the daylights out of them. People will buy that. Okay, donate a dollar to Institute for Autism Research, or donate two dollars. Donate a dollar, or donate two dollars and get the free download, and get a download with it for 99 cents. It's that kind of marketing stuff, and finding out what niches to promote the artist. Yeah, we also, I start, my God, I slept in condemned buildings, you know, when I was on the road. <laughs> Everybody said, if you don't pay your dues and starve in this industry, you're, you're, you're a liar. <laughs> There's something wrong. Everybody's got to pay their dues in this industry, and everybody has to pay their dues. Even 10,000 maniacs eating peanut butter sandwiches while doing lawn work in Atlanta. Everybody's got to pay their dues. That's an overstatement. They're nowhere near 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> Seven. Yes. Hi, my name is Jeff, and I'm from Erie. For a long, long time, I owned an art gallery for almost 17 years. <clears throat> Had over 150 individual art shows. Now, my business was an art gallery frame shop, photography studio, and also sold uh, and short wine. We relied on promoting charities. We relied on it. That was our bread and butter. We did every possible thing you could imagine. Uh, we did it for this, we did it for that, Toys for Tots, you name it, we did it. The musicians, integral part of this whole di this whole gig, their names were put up on a flyer, social media, whatever, back in the day, postcards. So we'd attract two or three hundred people. We sold them art, we sold them wine, <clears throat> they bought my photography, and the musicians always came out on top because they were always um, booking gigs. And that's a tight community here. I mean, there's no money down there, none. And so you have these musicians that would be shooting weddings and you know bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, gigs together, and we relied on it. Now it was a constant job to do it, 24/7, eight days a week. It, it eventually burned us out. We stopped. We finally folded after 17 years of doing it. You couldn't stop. You had to continue. Sometimes you'd have 100 people. Sometimes you'd have 25. Sometimes you'd have 500. But it was a constant, constant, constant grind. And it, I mean, one of the one of the reasons that business eventually failed was that we, as we got older, and, and you made an important point earlier in, the, in this, this discussion, you can't do it your, on your own. There was two of us doing it all the time, and we didn't bring in enough people to manage it. It actually grew to the point where it was it became a burden and you always got to do it that's my point thanks can i ask you a real question um just curious and forgive me if i don't pick the proper words for it but in kind of a general sense it sounds a little bit this whole conversation is that there's uh, an effort to piggyback on a charity for goodwill for their yeah. benefit of course and then rely on the trickle down effect. Absolutely, that was that was a key part of it. Now, <clears throat> and if you get the trickle down to turn into a stream, maybe a river, then you're really. Good. But it can it, it can get a little dicey because, like in a community like Erie, and I don't know what it's like up here. Say you have ten really good artists that are known within the community, and ten really good musicians that are known in the community. Those ten people are being pulled at constantly to do something for free. Okay. And a lot of them, very gracious, you know, so there would be there would be food, there would be a little bit of wine, and the single guys, you know, might meet some girls or whatever, but most of the people were generally in their 30, late 30s and early 40s. It tired them out too. And what happens is, what you have to be aware of, if you're constantly asking for free, eventually you start getting a pushback on like, wait a minute, man. you know, we know, we know you sold 30 bottles of wine tonight, and we knew you sold five pieces of artwork, and you're giving 10% to the Catholic charities, whatever. That's fine. What do we get out of it? Sure, I, I book some gigs, I do some stuff, I get some money out of this. But in the end, 
I'm using you to promote me, and you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a slight buffer in there that you've got to work well. And let me jump on that. It would be up to the artist that is doing the thing for free for them to exploit it for their own benefit, whether they videotape it, whether they do whatever they do. It's up to them then to take that to the next level, and now, they need to be embedded enough to do it. It's a very interesting point because some of the artists, and like you know, I'm in my early 60s. Okay, so there's a there's definitely a, what I don't know how to do and what I do know how to do. But some of the artists, you know, they didn't have, for example, the musicians, they didn't have a briefcase full of CDs. Um, the artists that were selling work on the wall, they didn't have a chance to get a reprint as a jacle. Those are the things that you have to be ready. You know, if you're if you're put in front of the audience and you have an audience and you have people come to view, view you, you gotta be ready to sell them something. You can't be shy about it. If you're like, hey, this is what I got, you want it or not. They don't want it, fine. Maybe that person knows over there. That's my point. Atlantic, uh, two, two points, two more points. Atlantic Records contacted me to produce a band called E, Everything. Huh. So I went down, they didn't do very much. But I went I went to watch the CC and I looked at their merch, and, and they were not signed to a label, they were completely self-sufficient. I looked at their merchandise table, and it was gigantic. And I said, when you guys make a night on your merch, what do you clear? I said, I don't need a bribe. He says, oh, we do like two or three thousand dollars a night. I'm like, why do you want to sign with a record label? <laughs> this is probably why I lost the gig. <laughs> this is like, you're never gonna see, you're never gonna make two or three thousand dollars a night. But they ended up signing with Atlantic and they uh, Secondly, my own personal thing was six pence down the richer. I had just signed a management contract. They said, so I said, okay, we're going on the road. We found an agent. He's been to bands as well. There's two big festivals in Europe that we want to play. Okay, one in Holland and one in England. So I had our agent get them. There's no money. I pay for it out of my pocket. Flights, everything. But it was a great opportunity because we had a brand new band, and I made sure that the band <coughs> played there as much as they possibly could. And I pushed for a better spot since we weren't getting paid. So there is the band, a brand new band, playing in front of 30,000 people. Yes, it cost me money, but we ended up selling. I mean, I, I made sure I had the entire merchandise thing. I worked it out with the record label. I was going to sell a demo. I brought over our demo. I pressed a thousand copies of it, lied to customs. Um, <laughs> and I special demos, 1,000 copies only, we sold them all, $25 a piece. What was the customs problem? Oh, you can, in those days, you know, if you were bringing anything in to sell, they would, they put terrified the tax. These are promotional items only, we have a British record company. So yeah, that's what we did. And, and, they, and, and they ended up doing really well, selling a lot of, like the regular record in, in Holland and England. Okay, this event is listed as an arts and business. Yes. Okay, so talk about the business. I mean, the tough thing, and I've worked for many, many, lived in many years in theory, and it's known as a cheap, cheap city. Yeah. Everybody wants to live for free, nobody wants to pay for anything. Yep. And it is living hell to make that transition from a competent, qualified, very good artist Performing or, uh, or you know, or a uh, you know, a features art, you know, a uh, painting art, uh, mm -hmm. getting paid for, it. and even art shows, art exhibits. You go to charity events like the um, um, uh, what's the, uh, the, the charity center on the beach there? What's the one for children? Uh, anyway, they have big art exhibits, and uh, you know, and, and you might. Uh, put the arts on display there, and you might sell a pretty doggone good picture for thirty-five dollars, mm -hmm. and maybe another one for fifteen dollars. Yeah, that's that's a scale we're talking about. And uh, all the arts, I've been uh, a member of the Philharmonic Board there, and I'm a president of the chorus, very heavily involved with fundraising, telephone soliciting, and whatnot. 
and people, and even with the United Way, as telephone system people. Cheap, they, they won't give you much of anything unless they have connection. So if you can make that turn, but the key point you do uh, is, I thought maybe this might be more about making that transition from the charitable, goodwill, circulation, get known, make connections, network area for nothing to starting to generate transition to surviving on a, a livable income uh, and you know getting it the connection, making that bridge across from you know uh, you know charity to pay me uh, existence, where you still do some charity too for a percentage. But uh, anyway, so you've got uh, now you've established a sustainable identity. You uh, evidently worked with some that have done that in spectacular fashion, perhaps because they were just that good and that charismatic, uh, as well as a good manager to do it. But how does the average person? Do? How do I was do? an average person at one yeah. time. I was very average. Yeah, you. I never left Silver Creek. Yeah. What I did yeah. was I worked. I had a mentor. Yeah. And I worked for peanuts. Yeah, are you an artist yourself? Then? You are yes, yes, artist. yes. I, I went on the road when I was 19 and 20. I made $67 a week. Yeah. Okay, $67. Yeah. It was in 1976. That's the amazing okay. sleeping in empty box cars. Yes. But, and, and I'm basically speaking, you know, as far as younger people go, younger artists is you start at the bottom and you take advantage of everything, be open-minded, forget the old models, look at what you've got. Now, in your situation, I can't say much about this, but I know that there's a community that got a huge grant. And so, within a city of like Erie or something like that, you unfortunately have to get, is there any politicians in here? You unfortunately have to get politicians involved. But the best thing to do is to go for grant writing for the money to bring stuff in for the arts and then that way you build up you have to in order for people to be enthusiastic about the arts you have to do something about it now I know I'm, I'm, anybody remember Peter Max yeah I'm friends with Peter Peter will do charity events if you contact his manager Gene you know Peter will want to cut of whatever he sells but you can get the highfalutin people in the area to come and get Peter Max artwork. And there you have brought someone in, you have made a draw of something, but you, you've got to go for the grant to get, to get people interested. And then, as far, and I'm speaking as far as music goes, you have to be involved in your area to see who the up and coming artists are. This is what I did. I was totally involved in Buffalo, going to the Continental on weekends, uh, looking at the starving artists, and then I saw the Goo Goo Dolls. And I said, I can do something with this man as a record producer. And yeah, so I, it takes I a lot of relationships. Self confidence and initiative. Self confidence and initiative. I wish I wish my class was here. I wish my 176 students were here. Yes, self confidence and initiative. That's how you do it. You Somebody has to make the step and sacrifice for what they want. Believe me, doing these events for me, it's, I mean, it's fun for me because these are my friends. But if I was doing, it's not fun. Joe, uh, Denny Lane's Arctic song, I just thought I'd have to be in a straitjacket. This was like three years of my life to promote and do something that I didn't get paid for. I just wanted to do it because I enjoyed the art of it. Other people can make money from it. Denny will make money. Uh, we'll see what happens. We're talking about doing a full album this summer. But yeah, it's the initiative. It's the drive. What are you going to do? And how are you going to forget about the old models? Because they don't work. <coughs> it's always about the initiative of what you want to do. I really admire you for what you did in your I, That's a tough town, man. I used to play like the Holiday Inn down there. That is a tough. It worked time. real well. It worked real well for a long time. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, it really did. It could still be going on, but the the constant promotion just. I mean, you know, I got tired. Of it. <coughs> yeah. Five, seven down. And there, there isn't any like you know, you become a lawyer, you go to law school. You become a doctor, you go to whatever school. And then there's a plan A to Z, one to ten. There is no A to Z, one to ten in this. You might go A, J, back to B, down to X, back to R. 
You know, that's the way it works. You have to be, you have to be as creative in your business dealings as you are with your art. And, you know, it takes that multiple mind level thing that's mm -hmm. difficult for some people to do, you know. Well, I'm a carpenter now. It's, 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 like, it's also, as, a, as an example of a market, uh, your issue is whimsical. You know, so that they'll be hot on one thing for uh, a couple months maybe, and then they totally drop it. And then you've got to come in with a whole different profile and approach completely uh, to try to reconnect. But that that that's how that's how it's done. I, I folks, I worked for Harv Weinstein. I didn't have to give him a massage. Okay, he managed to ban us from the Talus. I know Harv. Whether the dirt bag he is or not, that guy warped his brains out, and he was always trying a new model. He came into he came into UB. Uh, became a concert promoter in Buffalo, then decided he wanted to start distributing movies, then he decided he wanted to start doing his own. And the guy's relentless, absolutely relentless. I'm, I'm glad I only worked with him for a small period of time. But same with a guy by the name of Chef Gordon. I'm sure none of you really have heard of Chef Gordon. He went to UB, broke, wanted to become a, uh, a, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, parole officer didn't work out very well for him. Ended up at a flea bag hotel. Ran into Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and became Alice Cooper's manager. And he's relentless. He is one of the hardest working people. I, I had some conversation with him. Very better than that. It is all down to how innovative you are going to be and how much hard work you want to do. It's right. <laughs> You had a question. Sometimes it, it isn't even your innovation. You know, like, um, once again, this might, well, this might be a bad example considering the historical context, but what happened with Hank Williams, the way he started his career, is um, he started sh um, selling peanuts and shining shoes, and he wasn't doing that on his own initiative. The way he did that is, his just like me, his mother was kicking him in the ass. And also, what uh, his, eventually his mother kicked him in the ass into a, one of the local hotels where there was a radio station, and he was playing guitar, um, selling peanuts, uh, shining shoes right outside there. And eventually, one of the radio execs noticed him walking into the hotel, and then made his way to the radio, and then it went from there. You know, so it, the radio on up. And this is the '50s, so that's the uh, most current form of media they had. But I'm just using this as an yeah. example. And that, that was like the internet of the, of, mm -hmm. uh, of the day. And a lot of people in Nashville still do that, playing on the streets. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they still do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Got to work your way up. It's all about your innovation, how hard you want to work, how innovative you're going to be, how unique what you're trying to do is. And also, I've had students that have gone on the road uh, during their semester, you know, during their summer off and all that. And I went, when you went on the road, did you have a list of contacts you can make? Uh, did you get friendly with the club owners? Are you staying in contact with people? That's what you've got to do. No books. You have to do notebooks, staying in contact, and believe it or not, I also teach my students about thank you notes. If you want someone's attention that did something for you, write a handwritten thank you note. They will remember you forever. Or don't write that note and they will remember you forever. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. I still do it. Yes, Jim. In my industry, um, we I make endless amounts of contacts being journalists, and it's like you have to have these contacts because when something breaks or something, I can call. So I have cell phone numbers galore of like every politician in the county. Every because I'm constantly like, what's going on here? And so those contacts are. The only way I can get a story out in 24 hours, in most cases. So it's in a, you have to have that. It's really about making those connections. Making the connections, taking advantage of everything, and once again, you can do it from your area if you take a. I don't want to say take advantage in a bad way, but to see what you have and be, do something completely different, be completely innovative with it, and be ready. I mean, and once again, I love Denny Lane. <coughs> Denny is like the worst businessman. I guess when you're when you're a rock star when you're 19, you 
you know, you tend to think in a different way. But I'm like, why aren't you selling? Why aren't you selling stuff <coughs> to your shows? You're getting 200 people to a thousand people show. You've got nothing to offer them. What's wrong with you? You know, it's it's that merchandising. It's doing a free gig, taking advantage of it, and then marketing yourself. It does work. It really does work. And you can separate yourself that way. And once again, it's politicians. You do something with a charity event, contact the politicians, contact the mayors. They'll remember you, OK? Not, nothing better than uh, you know the mayor, Mayor Brown, getting invited to a, a gig and getting food in the back and all this other kind of stuff and getting his picture taken. He'll show up for the next one. He'll always remember you. But there's, there's more with that because it's like I'll go to events. Like I covered an event with a young man that won a medal in the state of New York for um, what he had done um, saving the young boy that had uh, over in Pasadena, not Pasadena, but Silver, Silver Creek area last year. And his mother ended up being the head of the Dunkirk housing development, and she was there. And I talk to everybody when I go to these things. So I was talking to her, and she's like, can you tell me when it's going to be in the paper? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. And now she's contacting me with stuff that she's got going on with Dunkirk housing, so I'm saying it. So it's more than just even the politics. It's just connected with every single person you meet, because you don't know who they're going to be yeah. or who they're going to end up being. So. And uh, I'll go ahead, Chuck. So, um, well, no, we're, we're, we're getting there. But uh, you've talked a lot about um, the, 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 the risk taking. Right, that's involved. You risk taking, putting your money out, flying to Holland, and who knows what's going to happen, right? And all these things, um, and how you have to be persistent and work. But you got to have a story. At some point in your career, there must have been a time where you're just pinching yourself, saying, "I can't believe I'm here at this event." Now, can you tell us an interesting story about something with, I don't know, maybe the maniacs or somebody where you were you were involved and it was just it was hard to believe. Um, given where you got started. Can I say something really silly? Sure. Okay. <laughs> In the midst of my career of working with the Goo Goo Dolls, I took a job at Record Theater, buying their laser discs for the chain of stores. And once again, it's connections. So there was a buyer from New Jersey, Vicky, Vinny Bancalari from Rockwell, New Jersey. Yeah, that's not mine. So, we get into a conversation about George Romero and all that other kind of stuff. And he says, there's a 25th anniversary of Night of the Living Dead in Pittsburgh. You, we should go and, and meet and, and meet there. And I'm like, why would we go to a harder convention? Are you serious? And he says, I got another buddy of mine from Detroit that's gone. Well, all three of us will meet. So we met there. We met, we went to the, you know, the fun Night of the Living Dead thing. And then we're having dinner. And I'm, this is the thing about taking risk and about thinking out of the box. So we're there, and then he says, I'm a distribution. Armin, you're technical. Don, you're historical. Let's approach the Night of the Living Dead people and say we want to do a laser disc release. And we were up against criteria. I mean, we were up against all the big companies. They went with us. So we started a Laserdisc company at a dinner table eating burgers and fries. And there I was with the entire cast and George Romero doing an audio commentary. And I went, oh my god, I can't believe this. <laughs> you know, here, and, and this happened time and time again. And once again, I didn't get paid for it. But what happened was I did the work and all of a sudden I started getting paid. And all of a sudden I find myself in England with Christopher Lee and Barbara Shelley. And then I find myself with Martin Scorsese. And then I find and I start doing all this stuff all over the world. Audio commentaries. And it all started because we all decided to invest in this little laser disc company. And yeah, I've Barbara Shelley was uh, you know my 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 teenage dream girl. She was in all these Village of the Damned and Dragon movies and all that. So I'm in England, I'm setting up, Christopher Lee comes in, 6-6, six, six, hello! And everyone just stops and looks, and I'm like, oh my god, that's Christopher Lee. As I'm setting up, so Barbara Shelley comes in and is saying hi to everybody. And then she comes over to me and she says, 
what are you doing here, my dear, besides looking pretty? <laughs> and I looked up, I says, I believe that's what you are here for. <laughs> she hugs me and gives me a kiss, and I went, oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a, with, as far as the band go, go right. we started at the bottom and we worked our way up, so it was like no big deal. Like right. everyone's fawning over the Blue Dolls, and I'm like, yeah, I, I, I who cares? <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily that way with the music. I guess probably one of the most things I was ever in awe with, as far as music goes, was meeting Joey Mullen, because I saw a bad thing live in 1972. And then all of a sudden, I'm recording him for John and Mary Records, so that was like a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. Did you pay for your lunch? <laughs> thank you all for coming. There is a table full of merchandise outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's all free. Thank you for coming.